The Inventive Podcast, mixing engineering fact and fiction. Inventive. 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 With Trevor Cox, Professor of Acoustic Engineering at the University of Salford. If I could grant you, if I had a magic wand to grant you a superpower, what would you like? I'd like the ability to be able to assimilate information better, to take on board everything. It's frustrating, isn't it, being a human, that our memories have limited capacity sometimes and that we can't always retain everything. So I'd love to be able to do that, a bit like in that film Limitless, you know, where all of a sudden he can absorb all the information around him and then process it all in his mind. I think if you could do that as someone working in STEM, then you'd be super powerful. You'd be able to build something really awesome, I think. I don't know the film Limitless. Presumably there was some downside at some point because that's normally what happens in these kind of movies. (laughs) Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't remember it so well. Yeah, there's definitely a negative connotation to it. There would definitely be downsides. And I mean, sometimes the power to forget is the important part of being human as well. So, yeah, that would be a definite downside, knowing too much. <laughs> well, I could imagine in the, in the meetings where you're meant to have done something, you can't pretend you've forgotten. That would be quite embarrassing, that wouldn't too. it? That too, yeah. At least you can make a little excuse for yourself these days. Oh, sorry, I completely forgot, you know. <laughs> but you're right. You wouldn't have that excuse if people knew about your superpower. OK, maybe I'll switch it to just being able to fly then. That'll just be fun then. Nothing Nothing bad coming of it. Inventive. That was Sean Cleaver, a space engineer who in real life wants to fly all the way to the moon. Welcome to Inventive, where we're really thoroughly mixing things up today. I've done my interview with an engineer, Sean, as normal, but this time I've given it to author, rapper and aerospace engineer John Chase to work with. Now here's the thing, not only has John come up with a story, but he's also created music for us, and he's mixed it all up with sections of my own conversation with Sean. So for this I've set up a miniature listening party. Waiting down the line is Sean, ready to hear what John has done. We'll get a reaction at the end of the piece. So brace yourself Sean, and take it away John. Status check. Go Delta. Go Orion. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. All systems nominal. 5, 4, 3, 2. Engine ignition. And we have liftoff of NASA's new space launch system, the world's most powerful rocket, carrying the Orion spacecraft crewed by Hugo, the first hamster to be sent to the moon. Wait, there's an alarm. There seems to be a problem, just waiting confirmation. We have launched without the European service module. Repeat, the ESM is missing. Without it, Orion is dead. He needs to abort the mission. Initiate LAM is missing. And we have the thought. Please check the ESM is missing. Winds-driven rain taps a rhythm on the windowsills of an apartment in Bremen as a young spacecraft engineer startles awake. It's still dark outside and the alarm clock is blaring out its morning call to attention. With a dry mouth and a rattled mind, the engineer fumbles for the snooze button and reaches for a glass of water next to the bedside lamp. It was the most ludicrous dream and as a reality settled in, she flicked on the light and squinted at the dry white planet across the room. Today was the day and she hadn't really felt anxious about it at all, until now it seemed. As her mind replayed the final moments of her dream, she rubbed her eyes and chuckled to herself at the absurdity of it all. She knew there was an absolute zero chance that the European service module could be left out of the Orion spacecraft, and an even smaller chance that her pet hamster would be on the crew. The crew missions weren't for a couple of years anyway, but still, it was mission launch day, and she couldn't shake the feeling that something could go wrong with any of the more than 20,000 parts making up the ESN that she had such an instrumental part in bringing together. So my name's Sean Cleaver, and I am an engineer, a spacecraft engineer, I guess you would say. I'm currently working for Airbus in Germany, the space part of Airbus, and I am involved in a really exciting program called the Orion European Service Module Program. And for that, I'm the industrial manager. So what is the Orion European Service Module? I mean, it sounds, it's a bit hard to unpick. What is that? 
Okay, so um, if you cast your mind back to perhaps the Apollo era or images that you've seen of, of the Apollo spacecraft, we're kind of doing a similar thing. Basically, in the next few years, uh, we're going to return to the moon. We're going to return humans to the moon. And for the first time, we're going to bring women to the moon as well. So it's a super exciting time. But of course, we need a new spacecraft to do that. So Orion is part of this system that we're going to use to take astronauts back to the moon. So essentially, we've got a new rocket, bigger than ever before, bigger than the Saturn V rockets that we use for the Apollo missions. And then we've got different modules on top of that that we need to get us to the moon. So obviously, right at the top, you've got your astronauts sitting in sort of like a cone-shaped module. Uh, that's being built in the US. But the bit that I'm involved with is the European contribution, and that's a module that sits just behind the crew module, and it provides everything, basically. It provides all the consumables, so it provides everything that astronauts need to stay alive in space, so the water, the oxygen, the nitrogen, but it also has the really important job of propelling the astronauts to the moon. So they'll launch on a big rocket to get them out of the Earth's atmosphere and into space, but then when that separates away, Basically, we just have one module sitting behind the crew module, and that's what propels the astronauts into space. And that's where Europe is involved, and that's what I'm, I'm involved in, in helping to build this module. But it's not just one, a, a bit like Apollo. Uh, there's going to be a series of these spacecraft. We're going to do a test flight originally, then we're going to take astronauts just to do a loop around the moon. Just, I mean, come on, it's pretty cool. <laughs> And then eventually, the, with the third one, we will hopefully be landing astronauts on the moon again. And it will go on from there. So this is really a series of missions that, that I'm involved with. I mean, without the European Service Module, we can't get those astronauts to the moon. I mean, we need something to propel them there. We need to support them and provide all the life support systems and the power, of course, as well, to get us there. And that's everything that the Service Module does. So, yeah, I guess it's, it's quite a, a mundane title for something that is actually really super important and really valuable for this, for this whole mission concept, really. The Orion spacecraft. Remember the name? A multi-purpose crew vehicle for travel in space. It's made up of three parts. One on top of the next. The ESM, the crew module, and the LAS. Now the LAS is the launch abort system to take the crew away to a place that's more distant. In case of emergencies occurring at launch, it keeps the astronauts safe, and that's all that we want. The LAS is connected above the crew module. The part with the astronauts sitting inside, and just like the Apollo version, it's shaped like a cone, and it's the only part that makes a landing back at home now the bit behind the cone is the esm the european service module with wings that extend in four directions like an x to get the sun's energy and solar panels that convert it to electricity and it supplies that power to the rest of the craft but the esm has got other important tasks there's avionic boxes with flight electronics to control the spacecraft and provide data on it it holds water oxygen and nitrogen too and tanks full of propellant for propelling us to the moon and that's all in a cylinder that's four meters high with over 20,000 parts and components inside. The Airbus Defence and Space site where Sean worked was a huge campus built right next to the airport. It was mostly a commercial aircraft site, but there were also a few buildings dedicated to space activities. On this cold, wet Monday in late November, Sean pulled into the site, parked her car and turned off the radio. When she arrived, she always looked across at the nearby airport and on this dark morning, the runway's edge lighting was illuminated whilst the surrounding airport lights glistened off the wet asphalt. Sheltering under her umbrella, she made her way over to the main building, walking past the big containers that they used to ship spacecraft. She had arrived earlier than usual and the daytime security were just switching shifts with the overnight staff. The facility was soothingly quiet at this time of the morning but soon the great swathe of employees would arrive to carry on their important tasks within the project. As Sean swiped her identity badge to gain entry via the turnstiles, a middle-aged officer looked across at her and nodded politely. He was one of a great number of staff that were necessary to keep the facility running effectively and was the reason Sean could get in so much earlier than her normal start time. She went over to the little machine at the entrance of the building and done the mandatory clock-in, marking the official beginning of her workday. Now, on any engineering project this big and important, it's good to be a tiny bit paranoid. 
It keeps a person on their toes and ensures that they're not taking any of the technology for granted. Paraphrasing the aerospace engineer Edward Murphy, it's useful to imagine that whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Yep, Murphy's Law. Basically to emphasise that things should be engineered in such a way that leaves minimal space for any errors to occur. Well, as much as is practically possible. This was as true for the current project as it was for the last, which was now installed on a rocket system with NASA at Kennedy Space Center, awaiting launch later that day. Sean felt mostly confident in the numerous tests, checks, controls and backups that the many engineers had already undertaken to get to this point. Everyone involved had had their particular part to play and there was little doubt that they had each performed to the utmost of their ability. Nonetheless, the morning's dream was still lurking in the very back of her thoughts, providing a heightened motivation. Sliding her chair up to the desk, she opened her computer to peer over her notes and the schedule she knew so well that she could very likely recall it all in reverse, if she were so inclined. But now, she was just content with getting ahead with her emails and work for the day, which after her dream now included double checking every single detail. Each subsequent assessment brought her increased confidence in the progress and quality of this immensely complicated project. After all, it was her responsibility to keep it all on schedule. And actually your task is, is, is in some form about integration to actually get these different systems to work together? Yeah, so my specific job on the programme, so I kind of have two roles. On the one hand, I am very involved with one specific module, so our second module. And that is in our clean room in Bremen in Germany right now. And we're just finishing building that. And we're just about to move towards the test phase before we send that over to the US uh, and hand it over to NASA. So on that particular module, I help out with the scheduling. So uh, we do all the assembly, the integration and test of each of the modules in Bremen. And of course, we need to manage that uh, and make sure that it's all done on time. So my job there is to manage um, a Microsoft project file, actually, that lists every single step that's required to put this thing together and test it. Uh, and I keep that up to date and I make sure that we are um, going to get it out of the door exactly when the customer, so when, when the European Space Agency and NASA need it to be out of the door by. So that's one of my, my roles. Um, my other role is a bit broader. I'm what's called an industrial manager uh, across the whole of the Orion program. So uh, an industrial manager is, is an interesting term. It means different things in different parts of the space business. But for me, on my program, it basically means that for every single European service module that we build, and we're going to build a few of these, I have to make sure that all of the equipment that we need to um, integrate onto this spacecraft, I need to make sure that it all comes at the right time so that we can build it of course so we don't build the whole spacecraft ourselves we basically buy bits we have subcontractors building different parts and then we put it all together here in germany so um yeah my job is making sure that everything comes exactly when it's promised and that it uh that it uh, you know if there's any technical problems that they're resolved on time so that nothing is disrupted in in this really careful um, integration sequence that we have. So yeah, those are my two jobs. So I'm more on the program management side of things, but I do also get to go into the clean room and see these spacecraft being built, which is, yeah, which is really amazing. Does it look kind of utilitarian or, or does it look... Do you know, I think it's beautiful. Whenever I go into the clean room where we're building this, honestly, it just takes my breath away with how complex it is but yet how beautiful it is at the same time. I mean, you've got, like I mentioned, you know, kilometers of cables in there and they're all different colors. They're all attached in very specific ways and very specific paths around different equipment. And I just look at that and I just think it's amazing that we've managed to design something like that that fits so perfectly together. I mean, it is a lot of stuff to fit into a relatively small space at the end of the day. And everything is there doing its job in exactly the right way. And there's some weird beauty about that. And it really, yeah, blows my mind whenever I look at it. It, lo it probably looks a bit of a, a mess <laughs> if you, to the untrained eye. And, and sometimes to me, I think, well, you know, is that really in an orderly fashion in that, in that spacecraft? But yes, everything is, is exactly where it should be and has been designed, you know, down to, to the centimetre or to the millimetre in some cases. 
Sean stood in the clean room, looking up at her current charge, ESM number two, feeling lucky that her company had been commissioned to complete a series of these modules, one after the other. This can be quite a rare thing as the usual science and exploration missions were typically one-offs. So in a relatively short time of working on them, she'd get to see the whole life cycle of an Orion spacecraft. From the third module in the procurement and design stage, through the current second module that she'd see completed and dispatched, to the proverbial icing on the cake, the first ESM, which Sean would soon get to see put through its paces in actual operation on the Artemis One mission. While Sean considered her fortune, 4,700 miles away in Florida, NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS, was already at the Kennedy Space Center's launch complex 39B, where it had sat for more than a week preceding launch. It was transported there on top of a crawler that took more than five hours to transport it the four miles from the gargantuan vehicle assembly building where the various SLS sections were stacked and integrated. Two white solid rocket boosters flanked its mammoth orange core stage and at 98 metres in height the compiled system stood taller than the Elizabeth Tower that housed Big Ben in London. It was still night time in Florida and the sun had not yet broken the horizon. Powerful floodlights illuminated the launch vehicle, which stood looking skywards, poised to penetrate the heavens, a clear sign of humankind's desire to break Earth's bounds and populate the extraterrestrial realm. In the following hours leading up to launch, there was still an exhaustive list of checks and procedures to be completed by the hundreds of skilled individuals needed to conduct the launch. An orchestra of organisers and targeted teams all focused on the job at hand. Back at Airbus, Sean and the rest of the team were primed with a buzz of excitement that underlaid most of the day's conversations and interactions. Everyone had a slight feeling of trepidation, but was generally optimistic that all would be okay with the mission, whilst fervently working on ESM number two, i.e. the one that would take four humans around the moon and back again. An ever-present knowledge of the risks involved in human spaceflight is always a sobering prospect, and although Artemis One didn't carry a crew, faith in the following missions was utterly dependent on all of the technology working on this flight, or Exploration Mission One, as it was also known. The stakes were high, but these scientists and engineers were extremely competent and confident in their spacecraft. Well, having worked in human spaceflight, everything is so um so well engineered you know it's even more like when when i used to work on um i just want to say normal but science and exploration missions uh, back in the uk you know where we would send a satellite up to do a job and no people already there we had redundant systems we had to over engineer everything so much so that this thing would stay alive in space and do its job now for human space flight, there's a whole extra layer to that. So not only does it have to be of good enough quality that you know it's got redundant backup systems in case something fails, it's got an extra level on top of that so that it's completely safe for the people that fly aboard it. And we're constantly reminded of that. It was only in a meeting the other day where somebody displayed a picture of the NASA astronauts who were likely to fly on the, on the spacecraft that we're making. And he said, well, look, these people have trusted us with their lives and their families have trusted us. So we really have to do our jobs to the best of our abilities. We can't cut corners. We have to do everything by the book. So I'm quite reassured by that. Having seen the processes that we have in place, uh, I think I would feel just as safe, if not safer, than flying on, on an aircraft, you know, because it's been so rigorously tested and so carefully developed. It had been a busy morning and lunchtime was a welcome occasion. Many of Sean's colleagues were already sitting to eat while she queued for her lunch. She was quite famished. The screens in the cafeteria usually just showed the menu or general information, but today a few of them had been tuned into a live stream from NASA, which was currently showing a clip of a past space shuttle mission. As Sean glimpsed the footage, she recalled journeying to Kennedy Space Center as a five-year-old and watching videos about the space shuttle programs and astronauts, which filled her with ambition and ideas about her own possible role in the future of spaceflight. She couldn't help but smile at the thought of how far she'd come since being that kid. Good to see you cheerful as always, Sean. Feeling good about today? It was Sean's boss. 
Yes, thanks. Just excited to see it finally go up. Yes, agreed, replied her boss. Listen, we've got some press coming in later to ask about our role in the Orion spacecraft. They want to inspire future engineers and I think you'd be a perfect role model if you're up for it. Sean instinctively replied back, Of course, I'd love to. And she absolutely meant it. Great, I'll let them know and pass you the details after lunch, her boss responded, before heading back out of the cafeteria with a sandwich in hand. For Sean, it had been a long journey to get to the position she was in now, and she felt very fortunate that the people around her had always been so supportive. Although one of her major assets was her personal determination to succeed and a genuine fascination of space that guided her towards educational choices and hobbies that were in alignment with that interest. In essence, shaping her whole career. So being able to share her interest and inspire others was always something that she found rather fulfilling. Feeling quite pleased with the situation, she paid for her meal and sat down to lunch with her colleagues. So I don't remember this, but my mum wrote it down in her journal at the time because she thought it was quite quite poignant. But um, we were on a family holiday to Florida and we went to the Kennedy Space Centre and apparently we watched this, this film. It was about the space shuttle program and, and astronauts in space. And when we left that showing, I apparently said that I wanted to be the first woman to have my babies in space because maybe without gravity, then it wouldn't hurt so much or something along these lines. And my mum thought that this was like, wow, <laughs> this was quite quite something for a five-year-old to say, um, which is why she noted it down. Um, but yeah, certainly from about the age of five. I always said that that's what I wanted to be and I never faltered from it. I always said, yep, going to be an astronaut, <laughs> going to do it. And then obviously as I got older, it evolved into, you know, I'm going to work in the space industry. I'm going to be a scientist and engineer. I mean, I was always fascinated with the stars and space in general, you know, space when it came up on the, on the curriculum. That was my, that was my moment. That was my favorite subject, science, technology, engineering and math. So I naturally went down the route of choosing STEM subjects for GCSE and A-level Level. But I also, just because I was interested in it, I had a number of hobbies that were kind of related. So I was a member of an astronomy club at a really young age. I had a little toy telescope at first, a little plastic one. And then when I was about 13 or 14, I got um, a more serious telescope. And I used to go along to the astronomy club and, and do observing with them. And I was into rockets at one point and me and my dad used to go and build rockets and, and launch them in the park, which was good fun. So, yeah, it was it was always there in, in my life. Um, there was always a little hint of astronaut stuff, spacey stuff in, in everything that I did, really. And, and you've mentioned both science, physics and engineering. Do you see yourself as an engineer or a scientist or is that a false choice, do you think? Oh, that's a difficult one because <laughs> I remember being at school and engineering was... Talked about a lot. I went to a girls' school, a girls' grammar school, and they were always trying to get us into engineering. And I was a little bit stubborn at the time. I was like, no, I don't want to do engineering because somebody's telling me to do it. You know, I want to do something more to do with the stars. And I was told at school that, okay, um, do something nice and pure like physics and astrophysics. And then later I could become an engineer. But if you study engineering, sometimes it might be a little bit harder to then go down the physics and astrophysics route. So that's why I chose to study physics and astrophysics at university rather than engineering, mostly because at the time it aligned best with my interests. But also I thought it would be really broad and it would give me the most options after university. So I started on the graduate scheme at Airbus. Um, Airbus has a good uh, graduate program in the UK and actually I suddenly found myself being an engineer by title but without any formal engineering training <laughs> I was just I guess reliant on my scientific mind and the rest I sort of picked up along the way so yeah I'd probably consider myself to be a physicist when it comes down to it but definitely an engineer now in my day-to-day -day work have you ever met a spacecraft engineer meet sean cleaver she's working on that stuff that most people just dream of space was a fascination from a young age peering through a telescope preparing for that next stage and so the next page yep gcse she told to study stem subjects for where they could lead and quite naturally that led on to a levels then a physics and astronomy degree fundamentally she always had her eye upon the heavens so her job as an astronomer was what she always reckoned but then a 
graduate program offered up a new career the destination still space but as a systems engineer essentially engineering is a way of thinking with an analytical mind approach and solve problems it's part of the program and a job that will challenge her but Sean worked hard and became industrial manager see it's good to have an end to journey towards but it's the journey that matters in the end if you keep reaching for your dreams one day you'll reap the rewards and then reflect upon your life to see the time was well spent now Sean was wise and Sean was caring supporting young women in science and engineering sharing her passion with the future generations while pushing for diversity to balance the equations well, I think I'm really lucky because <laughs> often I go to these like, I don't know, the Big Bang Fair or, or some sort of outreach event where there's lots of people from different companies. And I think, I mean, I have the coolest job really <laughs> of everyone. I'm making stuff that goes into space. So I can always tell the story about something that I'm making or, um, you know, my day to day work. And that's really captivating and inspiring for a lot of young people. Um, or at least that's what that's what they've told me. There's something about space that makes everything super cool and super interesting. So I think I'm lucky in that respect that that um, all of these missions that Airbus are involved with are really cool missions, and they all come with their own stories. You know, whether we're going to to Mercury or whether we're orbiting the Sun to do new observations, each mission is its own its own journey and its own story in a way. A little after lunch, Sean made her way over to security, where the press team were waiting. She led them over to the on-site visitor centre, where there was a mock-up of the International Space Station, as well as big banners on the walls with pictures of what the Airbus Defence and Space Team were building. Best of all, this area also offered a great view into the Integration Hall, aka the Clean Room, where it was possible to actually see the ESMs being built. It didn't take long for the camera crew to set up and within moments the interview had commenced. It only lasted about 10 minutes, but then just at the end, the interviewer asked a classic question. Some people often say, well, why are we going to space when we've got all these problems on Earth to solve? What would you say to them? Sean didn't have to think hard to answer and the words rolled easily off of her tongue. Well, that's really interesting, you know, when we aim for the moon, it's not just, just for, for a jolly, jolly. it really, really is, is for a purpose. We're going, We're going to, to do important, important scientific work, work and to accomplish these space missions requires us to develop, develop new technologies and expertise, expertise that will lead onto more discoveries increase and increase our knowledge as a human race, race in areas not just related to space. But it's really not as simple as just saying spin, spin off technologies. technologies. Remember, Remember, we've got an we've international got an space station up there, up there built, built by, by scientists and engineers, engineers, which for more than 20 years has been permanently occupied by humans doing unique scientific, scientific and medical research. research. They even recently took advantage of the microgravity environment to investigate a COVID treatment. So, you, you know, know we if we didn't have space travel and systems, systems in space, space what we could achieve on Earth would be much more limited. And of course, it's the engineers building things like satellites that have provided us with GPS and navigation systems along with Earth observation to protect our planet. The interviewer had a broad smile and was clearly satisfied with the answer. She thanked Sean to conclude the interview, then they wrapped up to get the story back in time for broadcast. As they passed back through security, the interviewer turned around to shake Sean's hand and earnestly said, It's really wonderful that we will finally see a woman step foot on the moon and that there are absolutely amazing women like yourself helping them to get there. It's just phenomenal. Flattered, Sean responded. Thank you, that's very kind of you. I do feel very proud to be part of something so cool. And what sort of reaction do you, do you get to the public from this? Because going back to the moon is retreading ground, isn't it? Uh, and, and does it seem, you know, why are we doing this? You know, haven't we done this before back in the 60s? Well, I mean, the quick answer that I would always say is, well, yes, but we only sent men then, American men <laughs> to the moon. Now it's time for women to go to the moon. It's time for Europeans to go to the moon. It's time for a whole diverse crowd of people to start accessing the moon and open it up to the whole world, really. And also, of course, remember, there's a whole few generations of people who weren't alive at the time of the moon landings. So I certainly wasn't. So it's going to be inspiring for a whole new cohort of people, really. A large proportion of the world will be seeing this for the first time. 
And that I, I hope will inspire young people and do wonders for the world of engineering. I guess if we put a, a woman on the moon, maybe we'll have a great role model which will get more women into engineering. Oh, I really hope so. I really, really hope so. I know we've, we've come on leaps and bounds in, in, I think even in my lifetime, in terms of diversity, particularly in the space industry, you often see, well, I noticed it with the, the Mars um, lander uh, the other day, there were loads of women in that control room. Uh, so I really hope that we can inspire even more um, young women to, to get into engineering um, because we do need more. We need people of all backgrounds and we need, just need diversity, full stop, because we need the very best minds and you can't therefore afford to restrict your talent pool. We need to open that talent pool as wide as we can. We need to get everybody interested in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths, anything like that. And then we can get the very best people working uh, on exciting engineering projects in the future. There wasn't long left to the end of the day and the afternoon had been quite slow going for everyone. There was too much going on and for the last hour, the facility had been awash with excitement. On significant launch days like this, the staff would often gather together to watch the launch on TV screens. But as the launch wouldn't be happening during working hours, the company decided that this time they would hold a celebration upon the successful completion of the mission. So on this occasion, a bunch of the staff made arrangements to meet up after work at a local bar instead. The reservation had been made for 7.30pm to give everyone enough time to get home and back to the bar to grab food if they hadn't eaten already. The venue had agreed to display the 8.40pm launch on their screens and always welcomed a diverse group of Airbus individuals who represented about as many nations as the Eurovision Song Contest. Shan's shift ended about 5 and by the time she was home it was just after 6. But she wasn't intending to go straight to the bar. She was keen to see her interview, which she had told her family about back in the UK. So that was her next step. Although she wouldn't be able to catch it on German TV, so instead had planned to watch it with her family via Zoom. In any case, the bar was in walking distance, so she could watch the whole news programme and still make it to the bar before eight. When the moment came, Sean's whole family was around her parents, including her little nephew, who always had so many questions about the spaceships she was working on. Auntie Sean is on television, he blurted out pointed in wonderment at the TV set as Sean's face appeared on screen. The segment was only five minutes long, but Sean could see and hear how excited and proud her family were, and it filled her with similar sentiments too. Can people really fly to the moon in your spaceship, auntie? asked her nephew. Well, it most definitely helps them to get there and back, replied Sean adding, and even though this mission hasn't got any people on board, remember it's just a start. By the time you've grown up, we'll hopefully even have a space station going around the moon. It'll be kind of like a space hotel where people can live and park up their spaceships before heading out to explore the moon or even another planet. Amazed, her nephew responds, Wow! Next time, could you take me to the moon? <laughs> Sean chuckles and then smiling answers back. <laughs> We'd have to apply to be astronauts first and then it takes a lot of training. But I tell you what, once I manage to complete all those bits, maybe I can give you a special core like this, but from the surface of the moon. As she spoke, her phone vibrated loudly on the desk. Sean tapped in her passcode. The message read, we're all here, but the bar is super busy, so I've ordered in your usual. Are you on the way? There was an hour to launch, so Sean finished up the call of her family and grabbed her things in a flurry of motion that stirred Hugo from his restful slumber. Glancing over at the hamster, Sean was reminded once again of her morning's dream. Butterflies began fluttering in her stomach, but there was nothing that could be done now, except to meet her friends, have a drink, and trust in the technology and the spaceflight specialists over at NASA. The ESM is missing for systems nominal. And we have So there's a lot still to be defined um, in terms of the, the lunar, the base, or what we're going to do on the moon going forward. At the moment, it's quite certain that we'll have a gateway. So essentially a, a new space station orbiting the moon. 
um, and that will be somewhere where um, astronauts can go and spend some time um, before perhaps descending to the surface or potentially in the future before an, a mission onwards to somewhere else. So that's pretty certain that that's going to be built um, and will be orbiting around the moon. And then I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, trying to build infrastructure on the moon so that we can extract um extract the things that we need to survive up there so perhaps extracting ways of making water or oxygen or or ways of um, making propellant so that we can reduce what we need to take with us and try and create some of the things that we need on the moon because that will really help us um, if we then go forward onto a mission to mars is that is that the goal then mars and beyond so after the moon definitely comes mars uh, we've, it's incredibly difficult to to go there and to take humans there. I mean, it's so far away. Uh, it's going to take a good, what, nine months or so just to get there. Then you would have to carry out the mission uh, and then come all the way back. So you've got to sustain life for that long uh, with very limited ways of growing food and, and creating energy. It's, it's very, very challenging. But I think it still remains the goal. I think um, that's the way that we're going in, in the space industry. Everything is sort of with uh, Mars in its sights. The moon is the place where the target is. Apollo carried 12 men on the last visits. We're going back more than 50 years after this. The mission name, Apollo's twin sister, Artemis. First one small step, followed up by some others. Already had the forefathers, now it's time for the mothers. All aboard for the moon is its source above us. We had one giant leap. There's more to discover First up in the agenda Artemis 1 And the initial preparations Have already been done It's a mission to explore The technology's worth To get it orbiting the moon And safely back to the earth Then a few years later There's Artemis 2 The first one Where we're gonna be Sending the crew It's mostly just like the first But only 10 days long To demonstrate our readiness For human exploration Then Artemis 3 Is what comes next It will see The first women on the moon Take steps and prove That humanity is really up for the test but it don't matter who you are, it just depends on who's best In the following mission, if they've made enough headway Artemis 4 will then begin the lunar gateway To make it easier to transfer to the moon We'll treat it like a stepping stone, so Mars will be there soon The volume was turned right up on the TV And the bar was brimming with energy The countdown had begun T minus 15 seconds. The hubbub continued as the countdown reached to 10. Everybody started to join in at full volume. It was like New Year's Eve had come early. The atmosphere was tremendous and the levels continued to increase as the numbers descended. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have liftoff of Artemis 1 carrying the Orion spacecraft on the 26 day round trip to the moon. The room roared with delight as the rocket rose into the sky and at that moment Sean realised she hadn't exhaled but all was okay so far. Fifteen minutes later the solar panels deployed. The ESM had spread its wings and in two hours we'd be coasting towards the moon. With the main excitement over Sean could feel the early morning wake up taking its toll. It had been a long day and although some of her colleagues were staying on a bit longer, a few were getting ready to leave so Sean decided she'd better call it a night too. Outside the night was very brisk and there wasn't a cloud in the sky and despite the streetlights there were still many beautifully scintillating stars to be seen. As Sean walked home she recalled the myths surrounding the constellations that she knew so well whilst trawling through her mind for the names of some of the major stars. To her, they didn't just appear like diamonds in the sky. She had a good knowledge of how they form, shine and then eventually die out millions or billions of years later, sometimes in huge explosions. She also knew how the nearest star after our sun is so far away that it takes more than four years for the light to reach us. And how the space between everything is so mind-bogglingly big that most of space is just cold, dark and empty a vacuous void that was nonetheless full of mysteries. It was at the same time awe-inspiring, but yet kind of unknown and really very unfamiliar. Before she knew it, Sean was home. It was only a short walk, but it was still lovely to get in from the crisp autumn night. 
Inside, the heating had come on, warming the apartment for her arrival. She made a beeline for the kettle and flicked it on for a cosy cuppa. While it boiled, she topped up Hugo's consumables, then had a quick look at her schedule for tomorrow. When the kettle clicked, she poured the water into her favourite mug, leaving the tea to brew while she got ready for bed. Her phone buzzed. It was her colleague checking in that she had gotten home safely. Sean texted back and thought to herself how wonderful it is to be part of such an awesome and friendly team of people at work. It wasn't just her fellow engineers and managers either. It was the whole crew of people involved in the general upkeep on the site, as well as her colleagues in other departments, sites and countries that she had to liaise with while pushing to get these projects finished on time. She truly felt part of a global network of people working together to achieve marvellous things. Feeling hopeful and pleased with the day she just had, Sean let out a yawn, got into bed and reached over to check her alarm clock. She turned off the bedside lamp, however, the room was still bright, especially her illuminated pillow. Beaming through her east-facing window was the moon, dominating the darkness of the night. The sunlight that it reflected had taken just over a second to travel from the moon's surface to Shan's pillowcase, where its journey terminated. As she rested her head down, she looked up at the almost full moon, imagining Orion speeding its way towards it. Just think, she thought, that in a few years we'll be sending people there in a spacecraft that I helped to build. But it was more than that, because burning deep inside, there was something driving her upwards, urging her to venture further, because this role she had was only a middle phase of her ambitions, a stepping stone, or a lunar gateway, if you will, to her own personal Mars. Her eyes may have been fixated on the stars, but her heart was set on the space between. She had the passion, she knew the stakes, and she was capable and determined to achieve it. And when that opportunity knocks, when space becomes the option through the door, she'll step through with a brave heart and a cool head, carrying her hopes, her dreams, and the knowledge that the sky really isn't the limit. As Sean closed her eyelids, it was like the moon was standing guard, and with a feeling of content, she drifted off to sleep knowing that because of work she'd been involved in, humans were one step closer to venturing deeper into space and into a possible future existence on a planet other than Earth. I notice on Twitter you, you label yourself as a stargazer is one of the things you put as the first term. I mean, what, what is it about stargazing that is just so captivates people's minds? I don't know, it's just so big, isn't it? So, like, I, I re vividly remember looking up at the night sky and it just sort of was a little bit scary because of the enormity of it and how dark the sky was and how bright the stars were. It's just magnificent and awe-inspiring and unknown, really. It's not like anything that we know on this earth. We're explorers as people, aren't we? We were exploring other lands by boat. And then as soon as we had aircraft, suddenly we could cover more ground, get places more quickly. And as soon as we could fly on the earth, it was only a very short number of years before we were flying into space. When flight was invented on Earth, we, you know, that opened up the world and actually made it seem a smaller place because you could travel around more, more quickly. Is that going to happen in space when we, when we can get to Mars then, that this great wonder of the space will seem to shrink? I guess, yeah, I guess it will bring the solar system closer to us. It will make space seem a bit smaller, but I don't see that being a negative thing because... I mean, yes, the world seems smaller now that we can fly places so easily, well, theoretically, <laughs> not at the moment. Um, yeah, the world seems smaller, but then we, that doesn't mean that we don't want to travel anymore. I mean, quite the opposite, right? I mean, I, I, there's still so many places on the earth that I want to travel and, and explore and visit. And um, if anything, it just becomes more exciting because those things are possible now rather than being impossible as they would have been before the era of flight. So yeah, I think the solar system will seem that little bit smaller, but no less exciting. It's a nice feeling rather than a, than a negative or I'm really tiny. It's a no, I'm small, but I'm part of something incredible, planet Earth.
Well, a big thank you there to John Chase for his prose, his raps and his music. Uh, I've got down the line here the real Sean Cleaver, who's just listened to the whole podcast, including John's bits. Uh, Sean, what's your reaction to uh, what John has done with your story? It's incredible. Honestly, I am so blown away by how incredible that story is and how accurate it is, right? I mean, I can picture every step of that. I can picture myself going through the turnstiles, going to my desk, doing all of that. Um, I'm just blown away that he's managed to put together something that accurate and that amazing just from the the short exchange that the two of us had. So, um, and his attention to detail is just, yeah, incredible as well. He's got everything spot on about um, about the, the, the mission and uh, the specific details of each component of it. So I'm blown away. I really am. It's so impressive. So even though that was obviously a fictional character in a sense in the story called Sean, it's quite, it did ring true. It didn't jar with you at all. Not one single bit. Honestly, everything was spot on. Even, you know, he's talking about my nephew. The questions that he asked, honestly, it was just so spot on. I just, yeah, I couldn't fault it. Not one little bit. And it's clear that he as well knows his stuff. He's an engineer. And that really is really obvious. He knows, um, he's talking about things that, you know, um, that us engineers know, all the different components, the different names and the complexity of these systems. So that really came across as well. Uh, yeah, and I believe he even researched which window the, the moon would come through in Brenham, which shows a, an attention to detail. <laughs> Yes, that is so true. And the fact that I'm having a cup of tea when I get home in Bremen. <laughs> Not many Germans would probably do that, but I definitely do. I've got my English kettle and my English tea bags. So honestly, he's spot on. I couldn't fault it. <laughs> now, he kind of alluded to something that he didn't quite spell out. Um, and I don't know if many people have picked up, but you've actually applied to be an astronaut yourself. I mean, there was an implication there, wasn't there, that you were going to reach out. So how's the application going? Yes, so um, ESA did their first call in many years. I think it's about 10, 11 years. And they put out their first call for astronauts in that time. Um, And the application period was a couple of months long. uh, So I submitted mine. Uh, Spent a lot of time working on it, making it perfect. Because for me, it's been, you know, a life lifetime ambition to apply to be an astronaut. I always said that that would be my success criteria was making a really decent serious application. So I put a lot of effort into it. I've submitted and now ESA are trawling through all the applications. They got I think 23,000 applications to be an astronaut and that wow. is just <laughs> insane. So mine is one of those. I've got my fingers crossed. I've got everything crossed but no news as of yet. So we'll see. Well, good good luck with that. Uh, the other thing I noticed in in the raps that John John did was one of them. He he used a quote of yours. I don't think he said where it came from. It was, uh, "It is good to have an end to journey towards, but it is the journey that matters in the end." That seems incredibly important for uh, for an astronaut. Well, for me, that that quote I think is particularly special because. I, you know, like many children, I declared I wanted to be an astronaut when I was about five years old. You know, it was a childhood dream of mine. Um, And I was fortunate enough that the people around me have always said, oh, yeah, go for it. You know, you can do it. You can do it. But actually, I realized over the years that, okay, put that aside. You know, it's statistically very difficult to become an astronaut. Your chances are quite small, just statistically. But even with that aside, because I've had that end goal, it's kind of shaped my whole career. I chose to do certain subjects for GCSEs and for A-levels. I was interested in, in certain hobbies because I was interested in space. And then I went on to, to start working for Airbus, you know, on, on these exciting science and exploration missions. And then I moved into human spaceflight. And it's all because I have that end goal in the back of my mind. So whether I achieve that or not, I don't mind so much because it's really allowed me to carve out a really really interesting career and I feel really lucky that I am doing the things that I'm doing purely because of a decision I made back when I was about five years old so yeah that's why that quote is special for me I think even if you want to be the prime minister or a professional footballer or any of these things that are really your chances are statistically quite small you should should hang on to that because even if you don't make it then you're going to have a really interesting journey on your quest to becoming whatever it is that you want to become. Yeah, the, the other thing I, I, I took from the piece was actually when John 
started to rap, how that lifted the story, I was going to say off the page, which I don't think kind of applies to a podcast, but lifted it from your headphones or something a bit strange. Uh, and uh, maybe wish that, and I'm too old to rap, but it would be a great thing to do an outreach, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it really brought the story to life. I mean, nobody wants to listen to me and just my voice for 45 minutes. So I, it was so nice to have that interspersed throughout and to sort of enable you to build up a picture. Again, particularly because I think it's quite hard sometimes for me to explain exactly what I do in my day-to-day -day job, what my day looks like. People are like spacecraft, office, engineer, and they can't quite see exactly what that looks like. And I think that John really helped us to build up that picture in our mind and, and give us an idea of, of what my day looks like anyway. It was pretty spot on. <laughs> and, and he managed to get uh, Hugo in there, the Hugo the hamster, I, I noticed. I know. And you know what? <laughs> this is really sad. Hugo's no longer with us, but it would have been his birthday today. So <laughs> honestly, when I heard that, I just thought, oh, my goodness, what, what a funny coincidence that I'm hearing this today. Um, and what would have been my dear little hamsters? Um, I don't know. He probably would have been nine years old now or something crazy. It was a long time ago that I had Hugo. But yeah, I really like that little touch. I think it captured uh the aspect of my personality quite well <laughs> well that's a big thank you to sean for coming back and listening to the podcast and, and telling us what what she felt about it and i'm, I'm glad she really liked what john chase has done because uh, it was quite an endeavor and uh, a, a goodbye oh thank you so much for having me honestly it's been so fun listening to it back thank <laughs> you. honestly i just thought it was just so perfect honestly like what John has done with Sean's story? Let us know on the usual socials or go to our website www.inventedpodcast.com and comment. You can listen to all of Series 1 on our website or on your favourite podcast app. And if you enjoyed Inventive, please like, subscribe and spread the word. Next time on Inventive is disaster risk engineer Joshua Makabuag, along with author Nina Allen. Now, Nina's written a tale of a rescue engineer called in after an earthquake who uncovers some disturbing memories from beneath the rubble. There are school curriculum and career materials accompanying this podcast. You'll find links at www.inventivepodcast.com or on the website of NU STEM at Northumbria University. They're the people making the materials. And if you missed us at the Edinburgh Science Festival, where were you? Well, you can catch the videos we made for that on the YouTube channel. Just search for Inventive Podcast. And finally, a big thank you to all those who helped make this podcast. We've got Anna Scott Brown and Adam Fowler, who were the producers. The music for the story was composed and played by Wolfgang von Vandergast, Risk One and Alt Kuiper, who was also on the vocals. Inventive's music was composed and performed by Brendan Williams. Animations were by Annabeth Robinson, images by Ben Warburton, and multi-platform and social media content was directed by Jill Davis. The Inventive project is from the University of Salford. It's funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and the podcast is an overtone production. So it's goodbye from me, acoustical engineer, Professor Trevor Cox. The Inventive podcast, mixing engineering fact and fiction.